All right, so we're back. Um, here's the results. It turns out that um, when you look at the, the, the manipulations for that first group, when they were reduced positivity, you would see that the control group has this many positive words in their own posts. And the experimental manipulation where people saw less positive messages, they have fewer positivity words in their posts. So it looks like a reduction in positivity when they see less positivity. And likewise, on the negative words, here's the control group, here's the people who saw less positive stuff out there in their feeds. So it looks like there was an increased negativity in their statuses when you, they saw less of a positive message. For experiment two, when they had reduced negativity coming into their feeds, so here's how many positive words they saw. They saw a jump in positive posts from the people who were seeing less bad stuff. So they had more positive posts when they saw less bad stuff. And that was uh, true in the negativity as well. So when they saw less negativity, their amount of negative words they themselves used went down. So the changes went in the same direction. And it looks a lot like the social contagion hypothesis is a better explanation of what's going on here, okay? So what kind of objections can we have to this study? Well, there was no review by an ethics board, and we're going to talk about these uh, review boards here in a second. The people who are participating in the study never gave informed consent. They didn't know they were doing the study, okay? Uh, that is very troubling. And even more, even after they completed the study, they were never told after the fact even, which might at least be a mitigating circumstance. And finally, you can see from this that they knowingly harmed users, right? They, their attempt is to make you feel bad in one of those studies. And so they definitely did that. They deliberately made people sad. And they did it at a scale which is incredible, right? That they purposefully made half a million people sad. All right, there are other objections we can raise to the way they did the study that have nothing to do with the actual ethics and privacy, but I'm going to skip that. There is worthwhile saying that even though they found an effect where they were able to manipulate the emotions, the size of that effect was tiny, right? If what you're saying here is that if this you know, people don't have just one emotional valence. So the people have a continuum of emotions, okay? And the idea is that if you look at everybody on average in this big green uh, distribution, you know, most people are, where, you know, around here with whatever emotional valence that is. And some people are exceptionally happy and some people are exceptionally sad, right? But what happens with this change that they did in the experiment is that they did statistically significantly. That is, they can demonstrate that they had an effect that they shifted people's emotions. What they did to their Facebook feeds indeed manipulated emotion. But the size of that manipulation is like shifting from the green distribution to the blue distribution. The shift is tiny, okay? Overall, it's not an impressive effect. It's equivalent, essentially, to changing the height of US men by 1 20th of an inch in terms of the overall change in the average of the population. Okay? So 1 20th of an inch height change is uh, less than me stopping slouching. Okay, so I want to stop here at this moment and ask that. Uh, you chime in on the quiz to see whether you what you thought about the ethics and importance of this study. Okay. So 
there is something called the Common Rule in the Belmont Report, which guide university ethics in human research. Okay, whenever universities do subject do experiments on human subjects, they have to adhere to this thing. All right, and what's very noticeable is that in the paper from the Facebook study, there was this statement. Okay, the whoops, go back. Okay, Cornell University determined that the project did not fall under the Human Research Protection Program because this experiment was conducted by this company, Facebook. Okay, so because it's conducted by a company, not the university, we don't have to do our normal ethics review. And the journal that published this paper had this to say, right? So it's against our journal's policy to admit studies that don't go through the common rule and are not part of the human research subjects protection. But we're going to do it anyway because it's a company and they don't fall under this category. Okay. So this is an interesting thing right here, right? There are a set of ethics laws for universities and those laws do not apply to anything that's not a university. So let's take a moment and just show you what these rules are. So the common rule is called, uh, is a short name for the Federal Policy for the Protection of Human Subjects. And essentially, it requires that research institutions make sure that they get informed consent from every subject who's participating in a study, that the studies themselves are vetted and go through a review process to make sure that they are they have benefits that exceed the risks to the study participants okay there are extra protections for people who are from vulnerable groups vulnerable like pregnant women prisoners children people whose consent can be forced okay uh, also fetuses and in vitro fertilization. Same deal, right? Consent is a nebulous concept when you're dealing with people who are stuck in a jail or children or things like that. So informed consent. Um, individuals who are participating have to know that they're participating. They have to know what's going to happen with their participation, what kind of risks they're going to face, what kind of benefits they could accrue by being part of the study. They have to know what the consequences of being in the study are. If they don't know that, they can't participate with informed consent. Informed consent can be withdrawn at any time. So even after a study is over, if after thinking about it for a while, you decide you're not really comfortable with that study and what it was doing, you can withdraw your consent and they have to remove your data from the study. So all of this stuff, these rules came about, as you might guess, because somebody broke them. Um, the Belmont Report came about in 1974, be basically to enforce basic ethical principles in university research because research had been conducted that was highly unethical. Uh, the Belmont Report really was motivated by something that was called the Tuskegee Syphilis Project. And in that uh, experiment, 600 African Americans were purposefully infected with syphilis and not told. They were let live with the disease for many decades. And in some cases, they passed that disease on to their children. And they were never treated for the disease, even though there was an available treatment. So this was a pretty horrific failure of ethics. Now, the Belmont Report has three principles. Beneficience, respect for people, and justice. Beneficience means you have to do a risk-benefit analysis. You have to make every effort to secure the well-being of the subjects. You have to be concerned about the loss of substantial benefits as well. So, you know, if 
the research has great benefit, some more risk might be allowed. All right. So we also still, in the end, though, have to protect the individuals in the study. Even if there might be great reward, you still have to consider that there might be a threshold of risk that is not acceptable for an individual to take on. Respect for persons is what leads to the idea of informed consent. You can't withhold necessary information from a subject unless there is some sort of compelling reason to do so. So in most cases, you, you need to know that their subject has entered into this research voluntarily. So in very rare cases, you can get informed consent after the fact. So uh, potentially, if there's very little risk to the subject, you might not need informed consent at all. Or if it's something like, say, a psychology study where you're, you're studying surprise, say, and if you told the person you're studying surprise before you did the experiment, it would be ruined because they wouldn't be surprised. So as long as the nature of the surprise is not highly risky, they would enable you to potentially do the research on surprise and then after the fact of the experiment, disclose to the subject everything that went on so they can get their informed consent uh, ex post facto. Okay, so justice ans answers the question, who ought to receive the benefits of the research and who bears its, per its burdens? Think about the syphilis project, right? There was benefit to society because syphilis was cured. However, who got the benefits of that? It was not the people who bore the burdens because they were never treated, not even after the treatment was available. So let's think for a moment about how you, a data scientist, should proceed, right? I mean, if you're working at a university, you're bound by the Belmont Report and the common rule. But you're probably not. You're probably working at a company. Um, and while informed consent is not always legally required for you working in a company, um, you, there might be cases where it really should be, where it might be ethically required if you thought about it. There might be times when even it is not necessarily even ethically required, when the impacts are so low as to be negligible, right? Because again, the university situation also allows that in certain circumstances where the risks are very, very low. But you can use these principles. You can use them and apply them when you are working at a place other than a university, okay? So um, it is possible for you to be guided by these principles even when they are not legally required to be used. So let's ask you a question, okay? You, how do you feel about the ethical nature of this study and whether it was important, right? Let's, let's compare your results. All right. When subjects bear little or no incremental risk from uh, research and they get to benefit from its results, you can take a cue from the Belmont Report and the Common Rule, okay? You, you can, at that point, when you are doing company-based research and there's no real impact, like I was saying, you can go ahead and operate uh, with this analysis with a happy heart, right? When other situations exist, it might be up to you to try to change how things are taking place if possible. Even when everything's happy, it can still be worth it to remember that data points are people, right? This guy wrote a little R stats extension that let him always have a little part of his plot that reminded him that these are not just data points, they are real people. 
and that can help lower the impact of data science on on ethical considerations you can try to just keep it centered in your mind that there might be ethical considerations and that might lower the incidence rates of bad stuff happening okay let's ask another little question data privacy how do you feel about data privacy is it your only ethical concern for data science projects So when you do a project, you've got some analysis you've done. You have, you're ready to release it into the world. But maybe just before you do that, stop and have a think. What could be going wrong ethically with this project? Okay? I feel like number one is a little difficult to kind of grasp, but you have to think about, is there a possibility that the conclusion you've reached in your analysis is unfair to some group of people or potentially some group of not people, right? Um, is there some sort of undersampled uh, problem where you're not getting good data? Maybe you don't have enough data coming from women and so the conclusions of your analysis might be unfair to women because it might recommend something that's bad for women because you don't have enough data from them. Okay, so number two is pretty obvious. If you've made mistakes because you've done shoddy work, that could be pretty unethical. The third one requires a bit of forethought, right? Is the analysis, you know, maybe the analysis says that uh, a particular area is got a higher incidence of crime. When you're publishing this, could this be used to harass people and minorities? Would it potentially say, is if, if this is a minority-owned area, right, where most of the people in this area are minority, then um, would your analysis potentially negatively impact property values and make poor people poorer, right? So this is just an example but this is a kind of real world consequence that your analysis might have. And you have to think about whether it's worth the risk to release things, at least having considered the risk, right, before you do it. Your analysis obviously should be independent of your actual opinion. You may have a strong feeling about a subject, but if the data are pointing in the opposite direction of your opinion, you shouldn't allow your opinions to influence the conclusion of your analysis. Now, there are checklists out there that you can use to help you make these decisions, right? To think about your whole project from end to end and make sure that you have removed potential ethical concerns. This is just one example of such a checklist. Um, and you can try to apply this checklist to many different components in your analysis, right? Think about the data collection. Did you collect enough data from women, right? Or did you undersample them? Think about data storage. Are you using a very easily hacked database so user data will be available to the hackers? Think about data analysis. Did you create a model that is uh, biased in a way to make sure that the outcome comes out the way you think it should. Okay, Think about the deployment. Are you potentially exposing things that are very risky about somebody when your software package becomes available? Okay, Maybe like uh, you're exposing user data about location and people could use that location data to go and break into people's houses when they're not there because they'll know from the location data they're out and about. So these are some of the issues that you can check for as you do projects and you can check them in many different ways. All right, let's finish up by asking some questions and seeing how you feel now after we've gone through this stuff.
What do you think about social media and online retailers? Should they be allowed to experiment on their users the way Facebook did? Should policing bodies have access to genetic databases when they attempt to identify a criminal? If the data have been freely shared on the internet, is it okay for my data science or research project to just go ahead and use them? All right. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that you all have a lovely week. I hope that the sound of Magic meowing outside the door, hoping for me to come feed him, wasn't too distracting at the end there because it definitely threw my stride off a bit. All right, have fun.